Well, it must be time because I heard the, the chimes of Evelyn Chapel. Uh, <coughs> hello and welcome to this episode of the Illinois Wesleyan University <coughs> Titan Talks webinar series. I'd like to wish everyone a happy homecoming. I am Adrienne Powell, Director of Alumni Engagement. While I would prefer to welcome you back to campus on this very beautiful weekend, I hope you have enjoyed the virtual programming this week. Uh, we are thrilled to be able to offer so much wonderful content from the Titan community. And I hope you found ways to connect to maybe your former roommates, uh, your professors, and, and maybe reminisce about your time at Illinois Wesleyan this week. Today is TGOE, uh, which in case you, uh, you were wondering, stands for Titan Green Over Everything. Uh, I hope you, were, you hope you are wearing your Titan Green and I hope you found ways to connect to, uh, to your Titans. Um, and now about this Titan Talk. Uh, we welcome your participation uh, throughout the, the talk um, through the chat function at the bottom of your screen and we'll get to as many questions as we can. Um, along with all of the homecoming events, this will be recorded for viewing at a later time and posted on the IWU Alumni Association YouTube account. Uh, so please subscribe in order to be notified as new episodes are added. We are honored to welcome Professors David Rail and Scott Ferguson as our speakers today. Thank you both for taking the time out of your busy schedule to discuss uh, David Rail is a graduate of IWU from the class of 1977 and is Professor of Music, Director of Choral Programs, and Senior Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Research at the Michigan State University College of Music. Over the past 17 years, he has mentored and served as principal conducting teacher and advisor to over 100 doctoral and master's students in choral conducting. Welcome, Professor Rail. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be back, if only virtually, on campus. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Scott Ferguson. Scott is professor of music and director of the Collegiate Choir. He's a graduate of Oberlin Conservatory, uh, the master's degree from the University of California, Irvine, and a doctorate from uh, the University of Wisconsin, where he studied with Robert Fountain, who was really one of the great, great conductors and conducting teachers of our generation. Not, he wasn't in our generation, he taught people in our generation. Uh, Scott joined the Wesleyan faculty in 1996. Uh, prior to that, he had taught at the State Conservatory of Music in Bratislava in the Slovak Republic. He taught at Hope College up here in Michigan, Plymouth State University in New Hampshire, the College of Worcester in Ohio, and the University of California, Irvine. Um, Scott is uh, a, a frequent member of, of uh, juries for choral competitions, particularly in Europe, and he's a recognized authority on Slovak choral music. In fact, he edits a, a series that's published by Alliance Publications. So please join me silently in welcoming Dr. Scott Ferguson. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here too. <clears throat> so uh, at the risk of stating the obvious and using words that all of us have heard before, uh, this is the last the months since middle of March last year have truly been unprecedented for the country. I mean, really for the entire world certainly for higher education and uh, especially for those of us who work in the field of choral music, vocal choral music, um, because of the, the health risks, which we'll talk about a little bit. So like so many uh, people around the country, really people around the world, uh, those of us leading choral programs in colleges and universities have faced significant challenges that we were never trained for completely unprepared for and that we never ever imagined we would have to confront. So it's been an interesting, uh, challenging, uh, stressful time for, for, for those of us in jobs like the job that Scott and I have, also for people in all kinds of other positions, obviously. Um, we have, there are physical health issues that um, we confront on a day-to-day -day basis. There are also emotional psychological issues of our students. Um, financial issues, financial issues for universities, for music departments, for choral programs, financial issues for our individual students, and, and then of course the, the artistic and musical challenges um, that we face in this time of COVID. So the title of this Titan Talk is Choral Music in the COVID Age, Resilience, Relevance, and Reinvention. Scott, you want to talk a little bit about the, 
the meaning of that title and the, the sure. importance of the three words sure. for resilience, yeah. relevance, and reinvention? <clears throat> well, Adrian and I were talking in the, uh, one of our many uh, Zoom conversations of the past few months, uh, trying to think of a title. And we were going back and forth, and all of a sudden, I, I just thought about what we're really all about, uh, what's happening this year. And I thought about our academic theme of health, healing, and humanity. And I remembered that a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, did a, a virtual project using <clears throat> excuse me, a round by Abby Bettinas called Resilience. And the text was, was quite timely. Uh, resilience, we are strong, shoulder to shoulder, keep moving on. Resilience, make a new plan, stand up again and say, yes, yes, we can. And I find myself thinking those words and literally speaking those words to the students every single day. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of our students. They are resilient and they are patient. Uh, they're coming to class, uh, even though, as David said, uh, there are significant emotional, psychological challenges. Um, you have a cough or you have a slight temperature and you immediately get tested and you miss a couple of days of rehearsals until you find out your status or you've uh, been told you've been in contact with someone who is tested positive. So it's a very fluid situation. And uh, it requires a great deal of resilience on that their part. And I've, that's sort of been a pet peeve of mine for quite a while. I, I went on a, rat, a rant one day in rehearsal quite a while ago, and I said, this, this choir lacks grit. Uh, and a few years later, a student said, they told me how important that <clears throat> little rant was. And uh, even a Google search will uh, yield results about the, the lack of, or de the decline of resilience amongst uh, students. So I'm just incredibly proud uh, of our students uh, and we, we will keep moving on. And the word relevance came to mind as well. Thinking about the repertoire, first of all, that, that piece of uh, resilience round certainly is relevant. Uh, and thinking about what other pieces I could pick when the focus of the semester is more process oriented than product and performance oriented. How can we uh, help the students feel like this isn't just busy work, uh, that it really means something, even if we're not eyeing performance in the same way we used to, or and we can't work in toward refinement in the way that we used to, although we, we still are, are trying. So I've, you know, I have some notes about some of the pieces that I've picked. And Reinvention, that started last spring, and we are reinventing everything every day. And it's interesting to think about where my thoughts were in March, April, May, June, July, every month uh, they evolved. And I had all these grand schemes and plans for things that I could do. And I spent the first week of classes talking with the students about all these possibilities. And then we started rehearsing and you get into the music and we all, I mean, so many of the students said, I wish we could rehearse the way we usually rehearse. And there's a great potential in this year's choir and in the university choir, uh, our other uh, mixed ensemble that, that I direct. Uh, they are just as resilient and, and just as active uh, as uh, collegiate choir. And I found that I let go after trying some of these new things, I let them go and said, my goodness, let's just make music. I mean, it's that part of it hasn't changed, but the way we go about rehearsals has changed. The, the academic schedule has changed and not knowing whether we would eventually go online, I took people in, more so in the second, in the, uh, second ensemble, who had quite a few course conflicts because things were different 
this semester. So uh, I'm doing a lot of extra meetings with students to help catch them up. And we need to do a lot more repetition because not everybody's together at the same time. But we've figured it out and we're finally getting on a roll only eight weeks into the end of the semester. So those three issues of resilience, making things relevant and reinventing uh, how we work and what our goals are, I thought would be a, a, a good way of framing this, the talk. You know, you would think that at this point, having been on Zoom since March 9th, <laughs> I would, I would More not, meetings already today. I would, I know, four, <laughs> here, this is number five. But uh, so those are, you know, certainly four, three very apt, apt words, Scott. Uh, talk a little bit about the organization, maybe particularly of co-choir, like what, what's the rehearsal schedule? How, you know, where do you rehearse? How long can you rehearse with how many people? Mm -hmm. Let's just talk about that a little bit. Sure, and I'll try to make it, make it short as time goes really quickly here. Uh, we have tried to find multiple places to rehearse, obviously, because we don't want to be in one place for more than 30 minutes. Initially, I took the ACDA guidelines, the COVID guidelines that came out uh, in April or May uh, at some point, and they've been revised through the, through the summer. But we know that we shouldn't uh, sing in one place for more than 30 minutes. When we're at uh, in Westbrook Auditorium, I try to keep the doors open. We've been able to reserve the chapel. Uh, that holds 250 people, but I think the new uh, capacity is about 40. So our ensembles are smaller this semester, obviously. So we are able to rehearse for a short period of time with both full ensembles spread all around these, the auditoriums, the auditorium, Westbrook Auditorium and, and the chapel. And we and have can, one, I ask, so can I ask how, what's the physical space? So for example, how many students and singers in co-collegiate co co choir? choir? There are 29 now and there'll be 33 in the, in the spring. Okay, so 29 people spread how far apart? Well, that holds 500 people uh, or so. So we have them uh, all the way down to the level of the stage, uh, all the way back almost. Sometimes I'll try to have them in a big or uh, two semicircles or now that we get into mixed formation all the way back with several rows in between and they're yeah. all making sure they're quite a ways apart. Of course, we're, we're singing with masks and we have a new mask that should be mailed today. It's called the Performer's Mask developed by a choral director at West Virginia University that has been tested by her, by the medical faculty there. Uh, it's rated higher than a surgical mask. That's great. Uh, very different from the Broadway singer's mask, which it, doesn't doesn't do much. It, it will allow you to articulate, but doesn't offer any additional uh, protection. Right. Uh, and we're the interns at my church job started with those, and we'll move to the new one. Uh, in one sixty one, we can't have the whole group. We can have up to seventeen people uh, in the choral room or in the band room. And nineteen there, and seventeen in the choral room. So we only work with two sections at a time there. So I've done a combination, and we have a tent outside on the beach in McPherson Beach, uh, which has worked in some ways. It's very difficult to hear, and they're, they're spread all the way around. So that's, that's very challenging. I have a, a lavalier mic uh, for that experience, and we've been able to do some eurythmics out there, of course. Uh, but that's that's not been as successful as it might be but again the students are incredibly patient and just, we just work with what we have and not one bit of complaining uh so we we go from one place to the next we'll have two uh i'll try to have some students working with uh, some sections we'll have sprint sectionals or five minutes over here in different parts of, of the room and come back together, there's a courtyard. We had a couple sections in until the air conditioning machine went on. You couldn't hear, a th can't hear a thing that the big outward, you know, the big uh, machine is out there. And the chapel has been a great, great help. Sure. So we reduced the rehearsal time. So I'm getting a half an hour a day, essentially. Now I want to be with all the, the sections and the whole ensemble. So we move uh, and you lose the time from moving from place to place. Um, but we're, that's how, that's how we're organizing it. 
That's great. That's great. And I know that you've, um, you're using a technology called a jam. Kazan. Jam Kazan. Kazan. I'm going to let you talk jam about Kazan. that. Kazan. Yes. And that, uh, my person with whom I got my master's degree, Joe Houston, who, who uh, was at UC Irvine, he has a, a men's group called Men in Black, B-L-A-Q-U-E. Uh, they, they have been re experimenting with Jam Kazam with live remote rehearsing. And he said, he, he mentioned that to me, you know, not knowing whether we'd be online or not. If we're online, that would be a possible way of, of uh, maintaining the rehearsal process, but you need a microphone, you need an interface, uh, et cetera, and you need an Ethernet connection. So without those three, it's, it's challenging. Yeah. So fortunately, we're still here. That was me knocking on wood, and we hope to make it through the end, to the end of the semester. But Jam Kazam has been a great help with regard to, to studio voice lessons. Some of our faculty uh, are, are using it, and, and um, instrumental lessons as well. Uh, a lot of bugs in the system, but we've worked them out, and it's marvelous. Uh, Companies is in one room, I'm in one room, and the students in another room, and we can see, work without a mask, uh, which is which is very yeah, nice. That's so true. I haven't explored Jan Kazan with regard to uh, ensemble rehearsals yet, but we'll see how how this semester goes and how spring semester goes. Yeah. Good. Talk a little bit about um, like under these extraordinary circumstances, how much, you've talked a little bit about this, but your approach to how much repertoire to do, how to refine it, what's, what are the, you know, what are the, what are the goals, what are the outcomes that, that you're looking for? Right. Um, well, that's been really interesting. I, uh, knowing that we were going to record some pieces, pre-record pieces for a quote fall concert on November, it'll be streamed November 13th, uh, I thought about the spaces in which we might record. And one of them will be Holy Trinity Catholic Church downtown. It's a rather large reverberative space where we usually do our, our uh, Christmas choral concert. And first thing that came to my mind was Immortal Bach, the Nistet with people all around. It's a simple Bach chorale, but you have five choirs and each choir holds each beat for a, no, for a different number of seconds. So it's aleatoric all the way until the end of uh, each phrase where the, all the groups catch up and stop. So it's really, really interesting. And we've done that in I think 2003. And of course uh, we have some really good low basses this year. So I thought of the Barbara Agnes Day, uh, other pieces that would be appropriate, that would be enhanced by a, a nice reverberative acoustic. And our chapel uh, without people in it is a really nice place to, <laughs> to rehearse. It's a nice warm acoustic, but not too live. Um, so I gave them 14 pieces, plus work for next semester. We are slated to sing Fern Hill, John Corleone's Fern Hill with the Illinois Chamber Orchestra on April 9 and 10. And we have our commission work uh, so rather un unusual uh, work this year. And uh, the only Bach motet I haven't taken on tour is Jesu Meine Freude because it's 21 minutes and I didn't want to take that much time out of a, out of a tour program. But this year there's no tour, so I, this is a year for Bach, Jesu Meine Freude. So that's in the works. Uh, and I was thinking this summer, well, we can't, what if we don't have any, any performances? It'd be uh, there's a wonderful arrangement or arrangements of Mahler songs by, by Gottwald, 16 part pieces, four <laughs> in each section. So I so said, what a great way for each section to get to know each other, to work with the notes aren't terribly hard, but it's, it's putting it together, which is uh, contrapuntably, contrapuntably very challenging and helping them become accountable. That's been the big thing this semester. Everybody is more accountable uh, sooner they're distanced from each other. They don't hear each other as well. They're singing through a mask. It's much more difficult. I, I know how difficult it is to lead the rehearsals. You're tired after you know, uh, two 30 minute segments. Um, so I tried to pick literature that would, that would uh, be enhanced by the um, places in which we would perform as it were. And because of our uh, the South Africa tour we took last year, I wanted to make a gift 
of uh, South African Peace for this wonderful high school choir in a township uh, outside of Cape Town. We had a wonderful exchange. So we will record that and send that to them as a gift. Talking, to, talking about community, uh, it's essential that we maintain a sense of community. And that's r much, much harder in everyday life here to feel that sense of community. Yeah. So I try to, to talk about that as much as possible every rehearsal. I mean, why are we doing this? What can we do to maintain a sense of community? And what can we get out of each of these pieces? How can we refine? We're, we're going after it just the same way we always do, but progress is slower. There's a lot more sheer repetition to make sure everybody is, is there. And, and as they're learning, I'm getting a sense of how they're learning, what is difficult for them because of this situation. So I'm tailoring the rehearsals uh, on the spot to how they're feeling uh, with each piece. And now we're getting along in each piece. And you know, uh, one of our students is online and I mentioned the challenge uh, of the sound and how hard it is for them to, to work. And she says, well, I'm listening and I can't tell the difference. It mm. sounds like collegiate choir uh, to me, which, which was wonderful. And we, the good thing is, is we do forget. You know, when you're in that situation, it is the way it is. So it doesn't make any sense to worry about it. You just go on and we talk about the same, same elements of artistry, uh, listening, and each piece is progressing in its own way. And we will see how far we get. So that performance will be a snapshot. Wherever Great. it is, it is. Do you have a date? You may have said this. Do you have a date for that performance? That people Friday, November 13th. Uh -huh. And it, we're, I've, from 14, I'm down to five pieces for Collegiate Choir and five pieces for University Choir. I first thought of doing a couple of rounds with both choirs together. And I said, well, unless we do it outside, even if we go to Holy Trinity, I think the optics of having, I think we could, that that's place sees 900 people, but they would have to be so far apart. I'm not sure the acoustics would work with uh, keeping around together. Uh, and we just don't want that many people in the same place together. Sure. So things have been evolving uh, as we go. Uh, and I lost, there was another train of thought there that well, I was going to ask you to expand a little okay. bit more on the on the the repertoire that that you're doing. I know you and I talk, have talked about this. I think you have some really um, some great ideas about repertoire, and I think so, you you had said that is there a theme at at Wesleyan this year, sort of a all campus? Yes, and I just remembered what I was going to okay. I was going to mention, uh, but I'll keep theme theme in mind. Uh, on the, the reason why I'm able to try things and let go of things it's because we will do what we can do on that day. We'll record what we can record and we'll decide if we want it, if we think it's ready. And the, uh, the, the listener will understand the situation. We just want to help people to, to see what we're doing this year. But the second half of the program will be a good 35 minutes or so of the South Africa program. Because one of the great difficulties last year when we came back from that incredible experience we came back to quarantine and then an extended week of break and then online. So we didn't have a chance to perform that program for the local audience other than the couple of pre-tour concerts. So that'll be a way for us to let the Bloomington community and campus community uh, hear that program. So we will have that half and then the other groups combining for about 10 pieces yeah. for, for a first half. Oh, that and, sounds terrific. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the, I had hoped to, to think about our academic theme. I try to think about that every year, what ways I can find to uh, connect the literature with, with the theme. And I've been more or less successful in, in, uh, each year with that. But this year, we, I, I don't like, I'm not a, a virtual choir fan. Uh, and even those who are who are really into them uh, will, will agree that it's the opposite side of the coin to a choral experience. Uh, it had nothing to do with choral music. It's a solo recording. Uh, and, but there is an aspect of community. Uh, and as uh, Eric Whitaker said one time, he said, this kind of experience has allowed people who might not 
otherwise be able to participate right. in a choral experience. Uh, and I've, I've, the particular disease, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of it, um, but there's some people who cannot be around other people in, in a singing uh, environment. Cystic fibrosis, maybe? I, I forget, I shouldn't misspeak, but in any case, <clears throat> uh, we've had thoughts of, of streaming into uh, hospitals. Uh, we're gonna stream into a fifth grade class later on uh, in the year. We, in the spring, hopefully we'll go downtown and sing outside an art gallery, have a little house music evening. Uh, that was one of the ideas for this fall as well. But what has actually happened, uh, what I've settled on is this resilience uh, virtual project, because I want the students to have, have done this once, because this will be a memory of what this age uh, has meant. So 30 years from now, they'll be able to play this virtual experience and, and recall that. Uh, and it makes them accountable too. They're recording themselves. So it's a way for me to hear them individually as well. I also love chant. And I think uh, this aspect of pure melody, uh, I'm shortening warm up periods because we have so little time to actually sing together. And I think accessing the core of who we are as human beings uh, through the singing process is incredibly important. I mean, breath is a source of life and choral singing is the most intimate way we can connect with who we really are as human beings, as individuals and as communities. So uh, any way we can help students connect with something that's beyond the surface, I think is important. The level of solemnity, profundity of chant i don't i don't discuss it in terms of uh, religious affiliation but the universal aspect of connecting with one's core and listening to each other the concept of purity of tone those elements are really essential for our work as as ensembles and later in the spring we'll We'll do a harder one. Uh, we'll do the processional from Hildegard from Bingen's Ordo Virtutum, the, the virtues. Uh, that's pretty complicated. We looked at it a little bit at the beginning of the semester, but again, things take so much longer uh, to, to work out. We thought we'd put that uh, in the spring. And this uh, South African piece, Noya Na, well, that'll be our aspect of community and um, cultural outreach, having just experienced that uh, wonderful culture. Uh, I wanted those who didn't have that opportunity to go there, uh, be exposed to the Tosa language with the, the click sounds. Uh, uh, it's very important that we not give in to current styles of, of, of marketing multicultural music. It's often the case that a piece will be uh, published as African choral music. Right. And this is, this is the selling point and it's awful. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different styles of music, you know, uh, in the African continent. And I wanted them to be able to be exposed to this one in an intimate way uh, in which we can connect, really connect with the people that we met there and tell them we're thinking about them, we're, we love them, we're, we're with them as a, in the world community. And then I thought of a way to get people to be able to sing together uh, besides chant in the easiest way possible is a round, it's a canon. So we have a, a Billings canon that I put the works of the doxology to and we have uh, another one, uh, to Portsmouth, an old sailor uh, round. And I use the, the Billings as a way, again, not to, uh, to speak about spirituality in a universal sense. I think this goes along with our, our academic theme. I think maintaining a, um, a spirit of thankfulness is essential. And 
throughout our lives, no matter what situation, but especially now, uh, we have to, or it helps if we can uh, maintain that sense of being appreciative, being thankful. The students said, I said, how's the transition from home? Uh, the first week of school said, oh, we are very glad to be here. We've been at home for five months. We are really happy to be here. And they're doing everything they can, you know, follow the rules to, to stay here. Uh, and the piece Hallelujah, by, arranged by Sean Kirchner. Uh, also the same idea. No matter if we are in pain, uh, no matter what kind of loss we suffer, we still say hallelujah. And again, in a universal sense, we still maintain the sense of moving on. Uh, uh, it's sort of a, in, from my, in my family, my family's heritage, this partisan work ethic, you know, you, just, you go on, you keep plowing, you know. Uh, and then other pieces, <clears throat> we were supposed to sing Canto Sagrados last spring at an on-campus um, uh, symposium on music, humanities, and, and religion, and that was canceled. And our commissioning work last year was actually written as a, a reaction to the first movement. And this piece is about political oppression in South America. So we will hopefully perform at least that first movement, which is the longest uh, movement so that's one of the pieces that uh, was designed to be for this fall and will be put off. So in every piece, there's some way of tying it into uh, our, our situation now, but I would talk about these things anyway, but they become especially important uh, in our lives now. How, let's go to the word relevance. How important in this time is it that the choral music we do is relevant and what are there are different ways that music can be relevant i understand but you have, i know that you have some really interesting you've already talked about some some great ideas but i know you also have some upcoming some interesting commit commission pieces that are mm -hmm. part of that commission series mm -hmm. yeah uh, relevance is is a big topic in the choral world these days especially amongst community choirs uh, and a recent article I read, the, a statement that, that hit home, uh, we've, for years and years, we've structured our programs based on impact, the desire for impact, as opposed to making relevance, the, putting relevance in the first place. That may be more essential for a community ensemble that is trying to attract an audience and meet the community. In our situation in education, we have a, a, a sacred mission to uphold the great canon of choral music and increase the canon, widen the canon uh, to include uh, aspects of diversity in, in so many ways, that's essential and to make what we do relevant to the changing nature of our culture, of education, of choral participation in choral ensembles. One of the sentences in this article is that uh, it's difficult to, to make an impact if the audience doesn't have any connection with what you're doing. But on the other side of the coin, as an educator, I definitely want to introduce music to students who, with, whom, with which they have no connection whatsoever. That's, that's our job uh, uh, in college. And I think choral music uh, in many ways can be that uh, innovator. Um, but in, the, in the, uh, <clears throat> the commission series, we've tried uh, I think more recently, uh, the, the people who I've engaged as composers, it, it sort of happens spontaneously in many situations. We've been very, very uh, pleased and honored to have as our benefactors, uh, Joe and Sylvia Anderson for, for several years, and other people have contributed to, to this uh, fund 
established to honor Sylvia's work in the, as a musician, a fine soprano, um, and with Delta Omicron, that organization. Uh, we've been able to attract the best. Uh, wonderful American composers, Libby Larson, Stephen Paulus. Uh, we had the King Singers, Philip Lawson wrote a piece. Yogi Orban is one of the best yeah. Hungarian composers. Uh, a couple of two Slovak composers. And last year, I wanted to, and we've had, of course, uh, Marilyn Ziffrin uh, early on in the time and, and um, Judith Shayton, a uh, retired um, co composer from Virginia. She was here as the, as the guest composer at the New Music Symposium. Um, and I approached her at that point, saying, would you be interested in writing something for us? And then I thought of, of um, I thought about making sure that we, I've been thinking more about the concept of relevance uh, in the past few years. And this, when we had the, I was asked to participate in this, this um, uh, uh, symposium last year, and I thought of the Canto Sagrados immediately, because it would tie in everything that that, that um, symposium uh, uh, wanted to, uh, to, to deal with, to address, right? And I thought of last year asking our commission composer to write a reaction to this first movement that deals about uh, uh, personal uh, people disappearing uh, and uh, uh, winding up in rivers uh, as dead bodies. Uh, and we were fortunate knowing that we were going to go to South Africa. I asked, uh, colleagues from South Africa, our new wonderful uh, director of music, School of Music, Franklin Larray, and a colleague of mine from Germany who teaches uh, in Stellenbosch. And they both mentioned Hendrik Hofmeier as one of the best, or the best choral composer, and writes instrumental music as well. And he took on this, this uh, project uh, immediately. So the piece he wrote, The Wicked Are Like the Troubled Sea, is a very challenging work. And unfortunately, we couldn't put them together. It would have been great to have performed the first move, the Canto Sagrados, and then his, his uh, reaction to it. This year, I started thinking about uh, the, trying to, based on our experience with the Orchid Ensemble, which is an ensemble of, of Chinese instruments, I thought of the guitar and the Minnesota Guitar Quartet. And that turned out to be too difficult to financially. So I contacted a guitarist in Chicago, a flamenco guitarist, Diego Alonso. And he said, well, I'm pretty busy, but I have a colleague who might be interested in joining me on this. Kenan Abu Afach is a Syrian cellist from, from Pennsylvania and they met in Chicago. And I talked with him and they're on. I said, well, I don't know whether this is gonna be a live remote project, a uh, virtual project, we, we just don't know. So uh, we're, both of them are gonna, going to compose the piece because they have found uh, aspects of Spanish music and the Arabic music, uh, they found similarities in ways that they can connect those two styles of music. So we are learning uh, the jinns, the, the Arabic uh, scales, groups of three, four, or five notes so it's not one, two, three, four, it's one, two, three, four, either a little sharper or a little uh, flatter. The first thing uh, Kina asked me in our first telephone conversation was, uh, can your choir sing quarter tones? So I knew we were gonna have a, a great time from the beginning. And two years hence, Rena Esmail, an Indian American composer will be our, our artist and we will have two Indian classical dancers as part of that, that composition. So we're trying to to expand. No, I, th I think I'm so impressed. You have one too, right? I, I'm re just really impressed, Scott, with um, the the way in which you've gone about expanding the canon in a really authentic way. That in in the world of choral music, this whole issue of the canon and its place is um, is a topic of conversation. And it is true that in some circles, there are some people who would upend the canon completely. I'm right. sort of Scott. 
I'd like to just keep building onto the house and adding rooms. Right. Uh, but you learn I so much from doing the great pieces. You learn about humanity. You learn about music, hearing. So I, I don't want to throw it out, but we yeah, do have. I, to I just love the way that you've gone about expanding the canon, as I and in in uh, creating music from other musical traditions, but in a really authentic way, not in a in the way that you know that we yeah. know what we're talking yeah what right. we're talking about um hey i just want to mention one thing about the collegiate choir commission series because i actually wrote an article about it yes, once, i was going to mention that 20 years ago but i think it's i think it's something we can all be proud of that in the 1950s when lloyd fouch started that series he um engaged two composers who we would now reckon, recognize as having been incredibly marginalized. So in the 1950s, there were very few prominent women composers. Women, had, women composers had very few opportunities. And in the 50s, Lloyd Fouch in Bloomington, Illinois commissioned Louise Talma to write this fantastic cycle of songs on John Dunn um, sonnets called uh, La Corona. And he also engaged Uly Ulysses K. Um, one of the most important African-American composers of really the 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, again, at a time when there were very few uh, opportunities for African-American co composers, particularly African-American composers who were uh, uh, co composing outside of that, that musical tradition. So I, I just think that's something to note, to make note of. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's amazing that Lloyd Fouch had sort of the, the the foresight to do that, but I think it's something we all ought to be proud of. And you might you have a commission work that you've been messing. So with. yeah, so you know we're confronting some of the same issues, healing. Um, yeah. All. So uh, I teach at Michigan State, and you might know that we un sadly are associated with uh, Dr. Larry Nasser, who um, abused literally hundreds of women, many of whom were students here at Michigan State. And that experience uh, has had a profound impact on the campus, on all of us who teach here, really on the whole community, certainly on the students. So about a year and a half ago, uh, I, a donor approached me and said, I'd like to, to pay for a commission. And, and then we started talking about what that might involve. And so I, I asked him if we could do something on the theme of healing. And my thought was that the campus in this fall, in a sort of post NASA time, would, there would be a need for healing. So we engaged the composer, or the Philadelphia composer, Andrea Clearfield, uh, who's been here a couple of times and we've done some of her music. And then she engaged um, the poet, Tony Silvestri, who's a fantastic poet, writes lots of poetry for contemporary choral composers. So they've created a 12, I think it's about a 12 minute piece for string quintet uh, and chorus on the, the subject of healing. But I didn't know, and this is, it's just an interesting how life works out. I had no idea at the time I commissioned the piece that we would have, I knew we would have a need for healing emotionally on campus. I just didn't know that we would have the issue of physical healing for our society. And, and then the sort of emotional, psychological, societal healing mm -hmm. um, after what we've been through um, just this last summer in so many of our American cities. So it's, um, I mean, it's incredibly relevant. We're not gonna perform it. Actually, I'm, I need to write to Andrea. I was supposed to have the score by the 1st of October, but. We'll hopefully get to it maybe in the spring um, at a time when, when other people can, audience members can hear it. But um, yeah, I, I, like you, Scott, believe that I think music from the canon still speaks to people, but I also think it's our responsibility to create, create new works that speak to, uh, speak to American society today and some of the issues that, that we're all confronting. We, the piece, we, we were within about two weeks or 10 days of doing, um, Greg Hella Johnson's Considering Matthew Shepard, which is this really very moving piece about a, the young uh, University of Wyoming student, a gay student who was killed. Uh, and that's actually one of the, the biggest regret that I have is that we never got to perform that piece because it had, was it, every rehearsal, the students in that, in our, in uh, Corral came out 
changed. I mean, it was, it was really remarkable, a remarkable experience for them. So I, I hope at some point we can get back to that as well. Mm-hmm. I should sit, tell you all that I'm just watching the clock. That if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Mm-hmm. Um, Scott, Before we get to that, could you just say, just I know that undergraduates on, uh, are online, but Tell them quickly where, you, where you're rehearsing. Oh, what are we doing? So, yeah, so two weeks before, so we fretted and stewed all summer uh, about where we were going to rehearse and what we were going to do. And then two weeks before school started, our president said, no, all, all undergraduate instruction will be online, will be virtual. So we, I have one, we have one choir of 15 singers. It's a, our 11 graduate choral conductors and four master students in voice. And we have been rehearsing every day uh, in a parking structure. Uh, and we can do, we do 40 minutes. They're eight feet apart. The, that's the width of, of each parking space. So there's a place for them to stand. And they sound masks, wonderful. With masks and with uh, protective eyewear. We do 40 minutes and we take a 10 minute break and do 40 more. I will tell you finally, the environmental health and safety people on campus have given permission. So next week we will move inside the, right. these 15 students in a similar situation in our in our hall. But uh, I, do, I, would, I think the remarkable thing to me, I thought choral music was dead this summer. Yeah. I was, yeah. and I think yeah. we talked, I, I just thought it was hopeless. And what's been interesting to me is how those 15 singers, and you've spoken about this too, the 15 singers have stepped up to the challenges and whatever challenges there are about hearing or singing with the mask, They've solved those within a few rehearsals. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, that, and and very quick there's quick. this incredible, I, it's a good reminder for me, particularly as some of us who are a little older and more jaded, not you, Scott, I'm talking about myself, ah. <laughs> but people really have a need to sing. Yep. Yeah, and those 15 students are so grateful to be singing and grateful to, and to be with each other. It's so interesting. They can't hug, they can't go out for a beer, they can't do all the things that people do after choir. Yep, yep. But, and they're wearing masks all the time, and yet they have also formed a, a community, a supportive mm-hmm. community. It's, it's a remarkable yep. thing, and it says, it just reminds me about the power of choral music and why Absolutely. it's so important. So yep. that may be a segue into this question, which I am just reading. From Which, my son. How about that? Oh, okay. Do you want to <laughs> show? I'll, I'll, I'll read it. This is from Philippe or Philip? Philip, yes. Uh, do you believe the choral community plays a vital role in maintaining or improving the good quality of life in the lives of the world? It seems to me that choral literature and singing are one of the purest forms of human expression, thus being an integral part in preserve, preserving our world relations. People in my field call this therapeutic recreation. Well. Wow. Philip is a therapeutic recreation major at SIU in Carbondale and now a graduate student there uh, in outdoor education. So I'm not surprised by that question. Uh, I think, Philip, this, this has been one of the most universal aspects of singing. It's, it's uh, I tell people uh, uh, when, we, when we sang, we began the Bach, Jesu Meine Freude, as it, if everybody would just sing a Bach chorale once every day, there would be world peace. <laughs> as oversimplification, of course. But it's true. Uh, the one thing that brings people from all over the world together is music, and singing in particular. Uh, we know what, you know, the, the the saying is singing or music is the universal language and certainly uh, singing because there is a text uh, and we can sing about, about aspects of life that are incredibly meaningful for us that help us deal with our individual lives and our lives as members of the world community. So absolutely, it's, it's music therapy. It is therapeutic uh, recreation, uh, as it were. So, uh, absolutely, Philip. It seems to me, I, I know that I, I conduct a community town and gown group, Coral Union, and, and my colleagues in that group are just so frustrated. I, I really believe that at the point at which we can come back and sing, choral music is going to actually be more popular mm-hmm. than ever. 
because I think having been robbed of that, people people are really longing for that opportunity. I also think we're doing nothing with, we have no audiences. We are doing only virtual performances. Right. And I actually think that people are longing for the human connection that you get from hearing a string quartet live, as opposed to a beautiful performance that you can hear through your headphones. So I, right. I, I do think that we will emerge from this. When, that, when we emerge from this, mm -hmm. the, the power of live music making and the connection that it fosters yeah. uh, between people and between performers, but also it's a connection to the past. I mean, I'm a kind mm -hmm. of a historian, I have a historic historian kind of bent and it, our connection to the past uh, and to the future mm -hmm. I think it's going to be is going to be even more and more uh, mm -hmm. important to people yep and the, the the physical physical the physiological effects uh, the endorphins I mean we every single rehearsal we have uh, uh, we achieve a high as it were and every single rehearsal I get goosebumps Right. And I show the choir the goosebumps and I said, you must find one, one moment in every rehearsal that gives you the goosebumps because that's going to carry you through the rest of the day. This, uh, this is a question from one of you, uh, yeah, Jessica, from Jessica yeah. Sheets from the class who just graduated yes. recently, a year ago. What COVID-related adaptations do you expect will, be leave, will leave a lasting impression on the future of music? Boy, well, I know uh, at least in the voice area, we are exploring, uh, we will be exploring uh, the use of Zoom for uh, guest lectures and workshops. Uh, when our dealing with small budgets, uh, what ways can we enhance those budgets and, and enhance the experience of our students? We certainly will be doing that. Jamulus is a wonderful platform for uh, live remote uh, rehearsals uh, and, and live remote performances as well. So I think the, the short answer is technology. The te technology is, uh, is developing. And this Jam Kazam uh, platform was developed seven, eight years ago, uh, primarily for, for jazz musicians. And because of money, the developers just it's sort, of, sort of slow going. But now this summer, uh, it's just gone crazy. So uh, technology will certainly be here and yeah. I think there are others no I, I i i agree with that i think that those of us you know all of us of a certain again of a certain age i think we're afraid of the technology and uh it's just sort of smacked us in the face and, mm -hmm. and we have we have to embrace it but yeah in a very positive way mm -hmm. so here's a question from uh ruthie farrell from st louis who's from the class of 1974 What's the name of the performer's mask mentioned earlier? How would I go about uh, purchasing it? It's called the, the performer's mask, actually. Kim Scott, K-Y-M, Kim Scott. Uh, I think, uh, uh, is it, I should get the, uh, the email. It's Kim Scott, K Scott at singsafe.com, I think. But if you, if you Google performer's mask, Kim Scott, K-Y-M, uh, after the at sign, it should be sing, singsafe.com. It's not, there's a resonance mask out and there's the, the singer's mask that was uh, from the Broadway Relief Project, I believe. And that's the right. real happy kind of canvas thing. Yeah. But, and that's what we're using. And I would say that there are some pluses to that, but there are also some minuses. I just Googled yeah. Performer's Mask Kim, and you can find some articles about, yeah. you said, West uh, Director of Productivities at West Virginia University. Right, right. And I, I was impressed with, it was the first time I saw uh, evidence of the experimentation, experiments uh, uh, led by the uh, medical faculty. So we're, we're hoping that that will get here soon they had problems their first manufacturer had to close because of covid cases right. and they found a new one so hopefully it'll be coming i'm grateful that our administration here uh, 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 thought highly enough of of the project to to uh buy the masks uh this first time you know for the students so we appreciate our administrators administration's help in this regard all right if there's if anyone else has another oh here's one more oh there's yes. a thank you from yes. And here's a note from Laura Gertis. Yay. Oh, yes. 
I'm going to read this. As the mother of two former okay. IWU choir members, Claire and Trey, I found your talk very interesting. Trey is currently cast in chess. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it has carried its own challenges. I do admire the resilience of all professors, students, and performers. Thank you. I want to say a word about, can I just say a word about student resilience? You yeah. talked about that. I am just like you, Scott. I have thought, you know, as I've gotten older, these students are just don't have much grit. They're not very resilient. And the last six or seven months have, yeah. uh, I've really turned around on that. Absolutely. I mean, I'm sure this is yeah. true of you. Yeah. We have students it out. who who have to take voice lessons from home with five other siblings and a barking dog. Yep. Yep. We have students who ha got into that were doing voice lessons from their cars because yep. they had to drive somewhere where they had better internet. We had yep. a student who contracted COVID and was hospitalized twice but continued to attend class from his hospital room. Um, you know, this is a I, this is a very resilient generation, and maybe exactly. they've been forced to become resilient. But I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna back off of being quite so critical of them because I I really do admire them, and they've stepped up to the the challenges of technology, the new new ways of learning. Exactly, uh, they're incredibly. I agree with you. They're incredibly patient. They're incredibly positive. Absolutely. They're incredibly uh, uh, grateful for what we're able to offer them, even in this yep. you know, ridiculously crazy time. So, just this week, a student said, "Who who can only come to one rehearsal a week?" Uh, said, "But at least we're doing. At least we're doing. At least we're singing." Exactly. So that they're absolutely fantastic. And yeah. Wesleyan students always have been, but they they've really really stepped up this year. Yeah. And I'm sure that'll talking about lasting effects. I think, I think this will this will this aspect I mean, of resilience hopefully will will stick with them. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, our time is just about up. So Scott, I want to say first of all, thank you to you so much for thank you likewise uh, doing this, and thanks for asking me to to moderate. And I'm going to turn this back over to Adrian. Right. Thank you. Thank very much. you. Thank you so much, professors. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your stories and expertise in the community. Um, it's so inspirational to hear how you and the students are able to adapt and show that resilience that we talked about. Professor Rail, I followed the story about Larry Nassar and it is, it's really heartening to hear about the composition that you're involved with relating to the healing of his victims and, and everyone affected by by those it, it was one of those events that uh, I never thought an event like that could change a campus community. Yeah, uh, 55,000 students and thousands of faculty and staff and it, it totally shook and didn't destroy but it, it, it as it should have shook the community and I mean the campus will never be the same. Yeah. It's not a, you know, not a question of let's, can we try to get back to normal it, it the campus will never be the same and it shouldn't be the same that's right and and i think that this this shows how music can be a tool of social justice totally. right uh and we honor those victims so thank you mm -hmm. thank you for your work on that um professor ferguson i have to tell you i was thinking about what i am missing most about an in-person homecoming and you may not know this but right. the collegiate choir performance um, during the chapel service, every homecoming is my absolute favorite thing. I always cry <laughs> and am just always so moved. Um, the music is just stunning. If, if everyone who's watching has not been to a collegiate choir performance at homecoming or anytime, I highly recommend it. It's really one of Thank my favorites. So I'm really missing that this weekend. Um, but let's work together to find a way to bring some of these performances that you talked about to our alumni community. Yes. Um, it's amazing the obstacles you're facing and conquering, and I agree that this speaks to the resilience of our amazing students. Yes. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed this Back to College class. I certainly have, and will join us for the virtual events coming up this weekend. This evening will be a WINS concert, um, and I think we're going to either link that or you can find that on the School of Music website. Um, and then this Sunday, we have um, Brunch with Saga Day. And so, among other things, uh, that's we're really looking forward to that. So I hope to, to see you all there. Uh, thanks for everyone who attended today. Say, stay safe, healthy, and vigilant. Go Titans. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.